the McIlvaney Weekly Commentary, covering monetary, economic, and geopolitical news events. Now, here are Kevin Oreck and David McIlvaney. Welcome to the McIlvaney Weekly Commentary. I'm Kevin Oreck along with David McIlvaney. The emerging markets, Dave, have been in everyone's mind. It's normally not. Most people just sort of take them for granted. But with the markets falling overseas, the uh, currencies falling overseas, and now the stock market here in America falling in tandem with that, people are starting to pay attention. Yeah, and some would still say, why should I care? I mean, I'm not planning on an overseas vacation or travel. Why does it matter to me? That's someplace else. They don't even speak the same language. You know, again, we leave, live in sort of an Anglophile world world where, frankly, why should it matter? Well, but how much does the emerging market it's a, it's impact? It's a big deal. So it's, it's a very big deal in the sense that, you know, let me just rattle off a couple things that I think people may not know. Emerging markets make up a larger percentage of the global economy than at any other time in world history. So specifically, 50% of the total global economy. So half of the world's economy is this this group, group of, of emerging people markets. that we don't pay much attention to. Right. So to assume that problems in smaller countries is without consequence is to ignore the scale of the emerging markets in aggregate. So and I think the second point is that most of our multinational corporations, if you're thinking the Dow 30 or the vast majority of the S&P 500, they're receiving at present 35, 40, 50% of their revenues from emerging market countries. So, Dave, what you're saying is what an American company like General Mills or, or somebody who sells cereal, they're receiving maybe up to half of their revenues from other uh, these emerging markets. Yeah, a third to half, and, and this has been an area where they've been able to grow. You're selling product in the U.S., but you've sort of saturated the market. Nobody's buying any more boxes of cereal, so what do you do? You go someplace else and try to get shelf space elsewhere. Mm -hmm. But to just think about this example. If a currency is declining in an, in an emerging market country, what it ends up doing is impacting the purchasing power of the local consumer. Right. So that box of Wheaties, for instance, maybe with the 10-15% devaluation in the local currency, puts the price of that box of Wheaties out of reach. Well, okay, so that negatively impacts the spending of that person and thus the revenues of the U.S. multinational. Ergo, the U.S. stock market can suffer greatly, and there are, of course, benefits, that's what we've been talking about, as well as drawbacks, that's what we've been talking about, from globalization. Markets are interconnected at every level. Well, and there is a disadvantage that a lot of countries, actually all countries have except for our own, in that they have to borrow in someone else's currency. We can print our own. They have to borrow in someone else's and pay it back. Most of your emerging markets borrow in foreign currency terms, and we'll talk about that in just a minute. These foreign currency loans... They're facilitated by the banking community, right. and, and thus you have one more issue of sort of cross-border vulnerability with concerns being concentrated in the financial sector. Well, and we're talking trillions here. We're not talking hundreds of billions. Right. Emerging markets, they've attracted, and this goes back to 2005, not just loans, but mergers and acquisitions, people investing in stocks, bonds, direct investment in manufacturing and services. You're talking about $7 trillion dollars of foreign capital that's flowed to the emerging markets since 2005. Now, if you combine the $7 trillion investment in emerging markets with the hedge fund community, 10 times larger today than it was in 1997 at the onset of the Asian contagion, you have a lot of potential volatility ahead. These are folks that are happy to short the market, make money as things are falling, go long, do it on leverage. I mean, there is a new element in the market where any trend that is in play is going to be exaggerated on the upside, on the downside, because you have leveraged speculators, more of them in the marketplace than any other time in history. But, you know, the data that's coming in, I mean, especially this week, is that the economy is not growing. I there, there's an old saying that says, when you're green, you're growing. When you're ripe, you rot. But the markets are the same way. I mean, if you're growing, it's green, everything's fine. You can get away with an awful lot. But once you get ripe and start rotting, you have to come up with other methods to figure out how to keep this growing. Well, I, th I think the Chinese manufacturing and non-manufacturing gauges reinforce what we saw in the U.S. ISM numbers from earlier this week. So it's not just us. It's China. It's it's yeah, widespread. It's, it's adding pressure to the emerging market declines. Um, you know, we had the HSBC PMI, that's Purchasing Managers Index, numbers out last week, which were terrible. And then we had the official PMI numbers from China this week. And what it suggests is that Chinese factories 
won't need as much aluminum, copper, steel. And so, you know, when you look at how the dominoes all fall, if the manufacturing indexes in China decline, that would indicate that copper from Chile is not going to be as in high demand. Steel from Brazil is not going to be as in high demand. And you begin to see why there's linkages and weakness in the emerging market on the basis of bad economic numbers, whether it is here in the United States or in China, as we just mentioned. Well, and you, you mentioned U.S., you mentioned China, but let's throw Europe in there. You, the European banks are very intimately integrated into these loans. In fact, I think it's larger than the United States, isn't it? Well, European banks have lent more than four times the number of dollars to the emerging markets than U.S. banks, but right around $3 trillion, and that's a number of consequence. I mean, from this morning's Bloomberg pages, uh, they say European bank exposure varies from country to country. You have BBVA and Unicredit which have big exposure to Turkey, Santander, which is a big bank in Spain. It's most exposed to Brazil. Standard Chartered and HSBC would be hurt by problems in India and Indonesia. Barclays, meantime, would be the most exposed to South African problems. So, I mean, again, you begin to see this $3 trillion concentration in European loans to the emerging markets, and again, how interconnected the world financial system is. Well, and we talked earlier about how those loans that they're taking out, it's denominated in foreign debt. So if their currency, let's use Turkey as an example. If Turkey's currency falls a couple of percent like it did last week, well, then that's like adding 2% to the principle of the loan. I mean, the, how long can you do that? Yeah, well, exactly. You've got the foreign denominated debt issue. It's front and center. And these countries, they're borrowing in euros and dollars, and that's the difficulty. They have to pay back the loans with a depreciating currency. This is an issue for a commercial enterprise and a government alike, because even a government that has a printing press can't print someone else's currency, right. you see? And, and that's the problem, is if it's denominated in a foreign currency, it has to be paid back in that currency, not your own. So you can't print your way to success, as we apparently can here in the West. So you mentioned, it, I like the domino analogy that you're talking about. It's a domino effect. I mean, here in America, we may not pay attention to emerging markets. They may not even pay much attention in Europe, even if it's four times the loan exposure. But once one of those dominoes falls, you've got Turkey and Venezuela, we can talk about China, you, you mentioned South Africa. I mean, these are countries we don't pay attention to on an individual basis, but like you said before, make up half of the world economy. And those are dominoes that are falling right now. Uh, the currency pressures, uh, you're right, domino effect of currency pressures creating bank solvency issues. Hmm. So let's look at that. If exchange rate differentials reach a critical level, then defaults become more common. Mm -hmm. An increased default rate impacts the lenders directly. And if you can recall that this is a problem that's really been created in the modern banking era under a fiat money system. Because yeah. under a gold standard, banking crises and currency crises were rarely connected. Yeah, well, you had both. You had banking crisis and you had currency crisis, but they, like you said, they weren't connected, and they seemed to smooth themselves out on their own without having any kind of real intervention. But now, the coincidence of those two, currency and financial bank or banking crisis, are, you know, it occurs too often to be ignored. It can work in either direction. You know, so you've got bank or financial panic, which can be met with money printing, and currency pressure, or like we've been talking about, currency pressure caused by a mass exodus of foreign investors, what's dubbed as hot money flows. Right. And that can hurt the heavily indebted with the payback on outstanding loans being more difficult, again, as that exchange rate differential widens or as, as credit ratings are negatively impacted, either one. So if you're a creditor, an institution lending into the emerging markets, you do so, Why? Because the loan rates you charge are higher. Right, it's right. more profitable, potentially. That raises a question. Are the loan rates sufficient to cover the additional defaults? Well, and we've talked about financial repression. We've talked about artificial interest rates. It's interesting that this market does not yield what it actually should yield based on risk. I mean, every risk has a price. Are you willing to loan to a dangerous country for maybe 20% interest? Well, maybe you would. You'd say, There's you know, a price. There's always a yeah. price for it. But that's the art and science of banking, figuring out what the appropriate rate is to charge, reflecting the risk taken in lending. Now, of course, the curse of modern banking is having the big central banks set the benchmark lending rate well below a natural level. Which does not guard you for the risk that you're going to take in the currency exchange. Yeah, when, when that occurs, whatever loans are made cannot 
cannot account for risk adequately. So the pricing of risk is critical for lending institutions so that the compensation for lending adequately accounts for the inevitable defaults. You're going to have a certain number of people who just don't pay you, and that's fine. If, if you're making enough money on your other loans, it will make up for the fact that you did have some losses. It's like the credit card companies. I mean, some of these people are charging 21%. Well, it's because there's an awful lot of default on the other side. Yeah, of they know they're going to have to negotiate some of it to zero, so that's true. There's, there's kind of a balancing act there. The banking system may be grateful to the Fed, the Bank of Japan, the ECB, for bailout dollars, but to conduct business as a bank banker without an accurate gauge for risk is ultimately a dangerous environment. You know, and, that, and that's an environment that's created by the central bank policies of intervention, of rate manipulation. Well, you know, we talked about retail management, and uh, I was mentioning when I was in college, I was a retail manager, and when inventory wasn't moving, that would actually show up as an increase because, uh, you know, inventories continue to come in, our trucks continue to deliver goods, but if our sales dropped, inventory was rising. That was a bad sign that things aren't going quite as well as we thought. This week, that's why Goldman Sachs lowered their U.S. growth estimates. They were noting that inventories surged in the fourth quarter by $127.2 billion. That's the holiday quarter, too. Yeah. Uh, yep. That so would normally be when it drops. And this is the largest move in inventory since 1998. I mean, this is somewhat surprising. But what about the higher equity prices? I mean, I'm, I'm thinking of Goldman Sachs and Lloyd Blankfein. And you've said that we're going to see higher equity prices prices, but now you're also downgrading the U.S. economy and U.S. economic growth. Okay, I'm, I'm sorry, I, I forgot. There's two worlds that we live in. You've right. got the economy, and then you've got the markets, and they're not really connected, not when the Fed is controlling the system. Well, then there must be three, because you've got also the perception that the Fed is trying to give. Now, the perception is, yes, we're going to go ahead and taper because things are growing. Now, we have no signs of growth, but they're telling us that they're going to taper. And, you know, I, I think of one of our guests a few months ago. He said, let's just go ahead and call it a taper tantrum because that's what the markets will throw. Since the Fed signaled a reduction in QE, they, you know, they promised to remove 20 out of the original $85 billion in monthly asset purchases. What the market's having to do is adjust to bad news actually being bad news. Can you imagine that, Dave? I mean, look at how many times over the last year we've talked about every time there's bad news, the markets surge because they think they're going to give them more free money. It's one of the memorable themes of 2013 that bad news was good news because it guaranteed the Fed would print more, buy more, do more. And now in the last week to 10 days, the market is digesting a Fed which embarrassed itself in the fourth quarter All right. when it flip-flopped on tapering. That was, I think, November. And now feels that it must stick to its guns for credibility's sake, even as economic numbers are deteriorating. Well, and don't you think maybe, I mean, Bill King had brought this out. He felt like with Janet Yellen now in, they're going to have to prove that she's tougher than people really think she is. Well, that's right. Add to that. Mr. Fisher from the Dallas Fed, who is now a voting member, and also somewhat hawkish. So, yeah, let's go back to this. Imagine a world where bad news is bad. <laughs> it's almost like imagining a world with gravity. I mean, last year was a year of counterintuitive behavior, often inconsistent with the notion of cause and effect. 2014 might just be more rational. Well, and unfortunately, that also means pain for the person who doesn't understand that the change has come. If it includes it continued decline in equities, I think pundits will pretend that it's the emotions of the investors which are causing a collapse. They always think it's an anomaly when something's falling, Dave. Well, the, the truth is quite the opposite. It's, it's reasonable to expect cause and effect. It's reasonable to sell unsustainable values. The market is having to recalibrate because the Fed's activism in the market was leading investors to believe that economic growth and business profitability was an extension of monetary policy, like an investment being underwritten or guaranteed by a large financial institution. I mean, so this is the Fed now, at present, backpedaling. Well, and I was looking at acronyms. You know, sometimes you'll see in some of the common blogs that they're using acronyms, and some of them are a little bit rude when you figure out exactly what the letters stand for. But there are acronyms about just always buying the dip because you know the Federal Reserve is going to print and infuse. And, and that's changing. The buy the dip mentality may not necessarily pay off this year. I think you may be right. I mean, should the multi-day correction we've had become a 15 to 20 percent route, in U.S. and European markets, you know, giving up in days, frankly, the gains that it took months 
to accumulate, then I think you'll see the Fed, with Yellen at the helm, begin to worry about the reversal of the wealth effect that they've been desperately counting on. So, you know, for stocks to give back three, five, seven trillion dollars in value alongside another bad jobs number, for instance, and we do hear rumblings about Dell kicking 15,000 people to the curb, then you've got the current calm at the Fed, which, you know, might force more desperate measures. So Yellen could come back out with more quantitative easing, more accommodation, but it's going to have to be at very much lower levels because it appears she, again, for credibility's sake, wants to stick to her gun in terms of keeping the QE dial down on track. Well, and as we've talked about before, I mean, it's not just equities we're talking about here. You know, real estate started to look like there's some stabilization coming into it, but really, it's because the Fed's owning all of it, right? Well, right. Well, the, and I think they're realizing that their efforts, the Fed's efforts to stabilize the real estate market, had a different effect than intended. You had private equity buyers which pushed up home values in 2013, and it was not your first-time home buyer, your, your classic owner-occupied purchase, but investors instead that dominated last year's real estate market. QE focused on two assets. They focused on buying government bonds. The Fed was buying government bonds, and they were buying mortgage-backed securities. It, this is where the Fed is essentially underwriting the entire real estate market. And this is the irony, not to the benefit of the man on the street. Well, it's like a hedge fund. It was to the benefit of a leveraged financial firm, many of them with access to cheap loans. So it was not as either stated or intended, not to the man on the street, but frankly back to Wall Street yet again. Okay, but you have to have the Fed doing this. You know, there are three characters in this particular equation of world economy or U.S. economy. You either fuel it with income, right, income growth, that's GDP, or you borrow more money, or you print what you don't borrow. Well, Income, I think, is now shrinking, Dave, so we're not getting it from the income side of things. As far as the borrowing goes, we've already talked about it. These countries can't pay back what they've already borrowed, and so we're having to print. I mean, where do you get the extra trillion, $1.2 trillion that we're not actually financing with trade surplus dollars coming back into the United States? Well, and this, this recalls our conversation with Richard Duncan a number of weeks ago where, you know, again, you have to expand debt by 2% at least or you begin to move towards recession. Or income growth. I if, mean, if you have exactly, income growth. If you can't yeah. expand debt, then you need to see income growth or it's just flat money printing and asset purchases which make up the difference. And you're right, disposable income, that was also a number out this week. This is the money left over after taxes. It dropped 0.2% in December after adjusting for inflation from the prior month. It's the biggest decrease since January of last year. And over the past 12 months, it's uh, come down 2.7% total. It's the largest year-on-year -year drop since November of 1974. Mm. So, I mean, again, income's not the cure-all. It's not the fix. And if you wanted to see real estate boom, a, an actual real estate boom on an organic basis, then you have to have income on the increase. Or, frankly, you could have demography, which is not favorable today, uh, which could substitute for growth in income. If that was on the rise, either demography or income, certainly you could see a sustainable bull market in real estate. Otherwise, it's just Fed-induced speculation driving investor capital into that little space. Which space space. leads me to believe that uh, if they do taper then what we're talking about is a real estate drop as well. I mean, there's just no way around it. Well, when you look at the subsidy that buying mortgage-backed securities, again, you're talking about tens of billions of dollars per month, what that has meant for the refinancing boom, what that's meant for the few first-time home purchasers out there, you know, it's been a great surprise and a great blessing because you're able to finance or refinance at well below market rates. So I'm going to assume something, Dave. I'm going to assume that we can't borrow that much more, and income growth, since it's shrinking, we're going to have to make that up with quantitative easing or just fall into a severe depression. So with that being said, then the dollar over the last few years has really been the place that a person goes if they think they need safety. I mean, gold we've talked about over and over, but really, if you look at the overall mass majority of the people, they don't own gold they'll go to the dollar. We haven't had much of a dollar rally with all of these crises going on, and gold is now starting to recover. So let's talk about gold a little bit. It's an interesting characterization. Between 2010 and 2012, gold was assumed to be a risky or a risk asset. That's what the news media loved to call it. It was the idea that all risk assets were moving in lockstep. They would sometimes say RORO, which stood for risk on, risk off. And in that context, you know, the price of, of stocks would move up and the price of gold would move up. And mm -hmm. then all of a sudden there was some question about what the Fed was going to do and the stock market would sell off and so would gold. And then gold moved lower 
and that idea was dropped. So for, for the last sort of 2012 and 2013, now your risk assets are just your general commodities, your industrial commodities and stocks. And lo and behold, they're moving lower right now. What are the safe havens that have been bought here in the last 10 days to two weeks? British bonds, euro bonds, U.S. treasuries, and, and, gold. Gold. and gold. Yeah. yeah. Well, so it's, I think it's worthy of note that gold stocks are, are up some 20%, 15%, 20% off of their lows. You've got industrial commodities and stocks, which are significantly lower, moving the opposite direction. Aluminum, it's near its 2009 lows. Copper is flirting with a breakdown, though it's not quite at that three pound critical critical level in terms of technical support. Um, but you know, you've got your emerging market currencies. Many of them are at 2008 and 2009 levels. Again, sort of reminiscent of where we were in the context of the crisis, the very peak of the crisis, if you will, in 2008, 2009. Yeah, but something's different. In 2008 or 2009, I mean, the dollar was rallying dramatically, and right now the dollar's just sort of sitting there. Yeah, it went from 72 on the dollar euro index to, to 87 in a very short period of time. This so, is in 2008? That's two, uh, between 2008 and 2009. Okay. And so far it seems that the dollar is not the solo safe haven. So, so since that time, the bilateral trade agreements, which are frankly too numerous to mention, they've been constructed to work around the U.S. dollar and not direct more traffic to it. And I think along with that has come just a sentiment change. You may look at the dollar market and the U.S. Treasury market as a go-to for safety, but not the only go-to for safety. And, and that's a marked difference from 2008. Which could be very much a marked difference for gold, as you've pointed out, because gold is now looked to for what it has really traditionally always been for, and yeah. that is a safe haven hedge. Well, and, and when they were associating it or characterizing it as a risk asset, it really was a mischaracterization. It has been, and I think always will be, in its simplest form, a form of money, uh, a means of transaction, uh, you know, a, a store of value, and this is, I think, the point. It was it was confused by an investor community that still doesn't know how to wrap their mind around what gold is or why they should own it. And by the way, most of them have sold it. 869 tons through the ETF were liquidated last year, and that was their vote of, I guess, we don't need it. Interestingly enough, in January we did see physical demand for gold off the charts. 91,000 500 ounces sold from the U.S. Mint. A few weeks ago, we had mentioned that the Austrian Mint was adding a shift so that they could increase production. The Perth Mint added a shift so that they could increase production. There is sort of this bifurcated world of we don't like gold, don't need it, and it's because they've mischaracterized it. And then there's the other side that would say, actually, we do need it, and it's one of the only things that we trust in a world where there is so much leverage and so much counterparty risk. There has to be some way of protecting assets and getting money outside of that network of counterparties. So this physical demand really shows what you've talked about with the group here, and that is there are two types of gold investors. You have the person who's speculating and only buying when it's going up or selling when it's going down, and then you have the person who's just accumulating. Uh, the Chinese are just accumulating. Obviously, people around here must be accumulating, too, when you have record numbers of mint coins being sold. Yeah, I think there's some people whose general impression, the first thing they think of when, when they think of any asset is, what's the price? Right. When I think of gold, I think, do I have enough ounces? Mm -hmm. That's the, I think in terms of ounces and not dollar prices, and I think in terms of long-term objectives, how I measure a part of McIlvaney wealth, and it is in terms of ounces. And if the price was five times higher or five times, or five, you know, one-fifth the current price, I'm still thinking in terms of how many ounces do I have. And in terms of, of you know, an asset allocation model, it has a permanent fixture in the portfolio. That, that's in stark contrast to the way it's treated as a buy today, sell tomorrow, capture $2 profit via an ETF or what have you. A great product. We've had proven to us in the marketplace that there was gold backing it for any of those who had concerns. Worthy of note, the government, our government can't come up with 300 tons of German gold, at least on, on a seven-year delay we can. It gives us plenty of time to come up with rehypothecated gold. But in the ETFs, 869 tons with the snap of a finger or the click of a mouse is delivered to China, liquidated physically, and then delivered to China. So well, before we go on to the stock market, I, I'd like to ask you a question. And the question is, if over 800 tons came out of ETFs and it went directly to China, now China is what I would consider strong hands. They're not probably speculating on the price here. So 
when the public starts going back into the gold ETFs, where are they going to get the gold, Dave? Is there enough out there to actually cover that? Yeah, Hong Kong imports for the year were, I think, 2197 And about half of that then went on to Shanghai, both for the Shanghai Gold Exchange and the jewelry demand that you see there. So it's a combination of investor purchases and, and jewelry demand. But if you think about that, 2,197 tons, you know, there's only about 2,500 tons that are produced in a given year. So that, that's just mind-blowing, frankly. That's a lot of gold. If you know the numbers, you look at that and you say, that, <laughs> wow. And for those of you who don't know how many ounces are produced or tons produced in a year, maybe that's not surprising. But that's well over 65% of total gold production, closer to 70% of total gold production for the year, and the Chinese took it off the market. Your point is very intriguing because – if 869 tons were available to the investor community, and with the click of a mouse you could go back and buy those ounces, you could say, well, you know, when the investor, if the investor comes back for any reason to buy ounces, there's plenty of gold on the shelf to repurchase. The problem is it disappeared, right. and it disappeared for good, as you suggested. That means that as and when, or should we say if, the investor community in the West decides that they want to own any ounces, it's going to put a tremendous amount of pressure on COMEX because now any gold that's purchased and has to be put into the ETF structure, exchange-traded fund structure, is going to have to come off of the exchanges, both in the U.S. and in London. And there's not that much. I mean, I can tell you, combined between those two places, U.S. and London, you can't get 869 tons with the snap of a finger. Well, and I'm Not thinking, happen. I'm thinking China is buying gold the same way the McIlvaney's buy gold. They're doing it, counting, do I have enough ounces? Because they have other means, they have other things that they're planning on doing with that gold. Not a speculation on the market and saying, oh, at the right price, we'll just throw this back out into the market. That's not what they're doing. Now, I know that I want to own X number of ounces so that as and when the market peaks and I'm reducing the number of ounces that I have, I still have a significant number of ounces even after reducing what I once owned. Right. Does that make sense? So, sure. I mean, I'm predicating the number of ounces that I want on the basis of the number of ounces that I plan on keeping indefinitely, which means that right now I probably own too many, and I'm quite comfortable with that. But, again, that's with the, the ideas we suggested last week with HSBC telling clients what they can and can't do with their money. With an individual depositor bank being nothing more than an unsecured creditor, I find their are very few options which are as compelling as owning gold or silver ounces. Well, and frankly, where else do you go? I mean, with what we're talking about today, with the emerging markets falling, I mean, let's look at the stock market for a moment. The stock market's really had a pretty miserable week, so let's look at the averages that we're at. Well, by contrast, I mentioned gold stocks earlier. I think they move in lockstep with gold and do represent a good value. But on a technical basis, you look at the S&P 500, and where do we go from here? I want to make two points one of the technical considerations, we have broken through support levels at the 50-day moving average and at the 100-day moving average. The 100-day moving average had, had past tense, held up nicely on the shallower declines that we saw this fall. That was mm -hmm. September and October. There's two further levels to look forward to or, or to look at, 1740 and 1710. That is the 150-day moving average and the 200-day moving average, respectively. In addition, you have broken below. You did this yesterday. You did this this week. You've broken below the December and November lows. That's not good. And what it tells us is that 1650 on the S&P and lower are not out of the question. And that gets us to a 10% correction. 20% correction would put us at about 1480 a 30% correction from the peak would put us at about 1295. That would erase all of the 2013 gains and then some. Well, and we've had a guest on, you know, numerous times, our friend Bill King, and he's talked about overlaying the chart from the 1920s and the 1930s onto today's stock market. And Dave, I have to sort of go back in a time machine here and, and reminisce because my first year, 1987, with the McIlvaney family, the stock market was booming. And I remember yes, I, was. I pulled out, before recording the show, I pulled out Don's, your dad's newsletter from that time. I mean, nobody was talking about the stock market falling. But Barron's had shown this same chart that Bill King is talking about. An overlay of kind of past market behavior and pricing in the marketplace 
in the 1930s right. with sort of current behavior and trends and market dynamics, growth rates, etc. Well, yeah. and there was a cliff coming. You know, we've all seen those movies where somebody's in a raft and you can hear the waterfall in the distance. Exactly. There was a cliff coming. And this this is what your dad said in 1987 when the stock market was booming. This is in, no, August of 87. August of 87. This is before the crash in, in October of 87. He said the conventional wisdom on Wall Street now says that the U.S. stock market will not top until 1989 or later. It says the great majority of Investors believe that armed with that foreknowledge, they'll get out near the top and make a real killing. And he says this writer is skeptical. He goes on to say that the U.S. stock market right now is not based on value but on the greater fool theory. It's for speculators, not investors. This writer has a hunch, and again, this is in August of 87 before the October crash. So this writer has a hunch that the U.S. stock market will top out and crash well before 1989, perhaps even the fall of 1987. Now, I had clients, even though I was new here, I had clients who got out of the stock market because of what your dad said in August of 1987, and they were intact with a beautifully high stock market. They took their highs and they avoided the carnage that occurred that still is a historic crash. Well, you're right to, I mean, that 87 newsletter is fantastic. You, you go back a few pages and he talks about the coming crash in Japanese equities. You right. know, and if you recall, they were marching from 30 to 40,000. This is the Nikkei. Mm. And you know, after that, it, it took the next 20 years to go from 40,000 to right around 7,000. Mm. And, and that decline, he's talking about it, and it happened just a few months thereafter. You're so right. I mean, it is a good perspective. Well, you're right, King... He overlays the S&P chart of the last two years with that of the S&P from 1928 to 1930. And there is an uncanny similarity in you, the trading pattern. You can hear the waterfall. Yeah. And at this juncture, you should expect a rally. You know, if you're just looking at the overlay of the charts, we've had a decent decline, 5 6 7%. A decent rally, but here's the problem. Your large investors will sell everything in that rally. And if the pattern holds, it's followed by... A 60% decline. Mm. Now, I, frankly, I think that we're going to see a shallower 30 or 40% decline. I don't think we'll see as much as 60%. But, that, but that's still huge. It's severe for the investor who's basically repeating their 2008 experience. Mm -hmm. And so if, I mean, if your nerves are still frayed from 2008 uh, and you don't mind them being frayed further, stick around. You should enjoy this. It's still, it hasn't prevented the Wall Street powerhouses from proclaiming, trumpeting, getting excited about what is to them another banner year. Mm -hmm. You know, low side estimates are that the S&P will grow 3% up to 12%, you know, following what we had in 2013. So here are the targets. JP Morgan thinks we'll finish the year at 2075 on the S&P, about a 12% gain. Morgan Stanley thinks we'll finish, you know, 2014, 2015 on the S&P. Bank of America, 2000. BlackRock, about 1920. More conservative estimates for Citigroup and Goldman are around 1900. That would be a 3% gain for the S&P, almost an exact mirror to what they think, at least more, Goldman we mentioned earlier, in terms of their growth in the U.S. economy. You've got folks like Mr. James Paulson from Wellington Asset Management, and of course they always quote him in the number of assets that Wellington has in their management, hundreds of billions of dollars. And February 30 said, you know, for the first time in this recovery, we have synchronized global growth. Uh -huh. uh, so that's what this last week looked like, huh? And he goes on to say that China is not contracting. They're just growing slower. And we are seeing a broadening of economic growth. Hmm. Where does he see that? I'm just wondering where he sees the broadening of economic growth. Well, okay, then let's go to those ISM numbers that we talked about earlier. We talked about a contraction, and this is scaring the guys who actually understand the numbers. Yeah, yeah. this week's ISM stirred the nerves of Mr. Market. It was the Institute for Supply Management Factory Index, uh, and the surprise drop from 56.5 to 51.3. Uh, what the market had expected was a mild decline from 56.5 to 56. Getting to 51.3 scared the socks off of a lot of participants on Wall Street. But perhaps it's like the December unemployment number. It's just a one-off deal, an anomaly in the context of an otherwise robust economic recovery. You know, And again, maybe we should hang our hats on Mr. Paulson's comment from February 3rd. What we're really witnessing is not an emerging market meltdown, but synchronized global growth. <laughs> well, that's a great way to say that. There, there is no man behind the curtain. Just, you know, yeah. <laughs> What's interesting to me, Kevin, is that many economists are actually blaming the weather. Some of these numbers that are coming out that are negative. Bank of America is suggesting that declines in equities here 
This is very interesting. And abroad. That guy gets six figures a year for coming to that conclusion. You know, you have Ford and GM. They're crying about the fact that bad weather made for weaker sales in January, which is odd because Mercedes... Mercedes posted the best January retail sales in their companies. So, so what you're saying is, well, I saw the snowman commercials. You know, it was Santa Claus going and buying a Mercedes. <laughs> so maybe those worked. I guess when they saw the snow, it's like, hey, babe, let's go buy a Mercedes. Have you been naughty or nice? We know at the upper <laughs> the upper crust has been very nice. Yeah. Maybe it's just a socioeconomic difference. Well, of course, that may have something to do with the Fed wealth effects working their way into the quote unquote real economy. And I, you know, I, I guess I'm surprised. You watched the Super Bowl, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. It's something of a carnage. Well, <laughs> I didn't I, want to talk about it on here. I'm surprised it wasn't a Maserati record being set in January. Did you see that commercial? It was sort of silly, yeah, but I still would like a Maserati. It was the silliest commercial ever. What would, what would it do? <laughs> it's when you take something conceptual and make it too conceptual, everybody scratches their head and says, Maybe somebody smarter than me got it. But the problem is nobody got it. Well, okay, since we're going down memory lane, I'm older than you, Dave. I, I get to do this quite a bit more than you. But uh, the year 2000, okay, the year 2000, the stock market was booming. Tech stocks were booming. Y2K never occurred. The lights never went out. And the commercials during the Super Bowl in the year 2000, before the crash, the tech stock crash in March, those commercials were ridiculous. They were conceptual. You had really no idea what the product was, but they had so much money to burn. These IPOs and this tech stock boom, they literally purposely burned on commercials that didn't sell anything. Right. Wasted ad money. What was it? Four million dollars for 30 seconds this year. About twice what it was a decade ago. Yeah. You know, just kind of again on that same theme, a walk down memory lane. This week is the first week that Janet Yellen is in charge of the Fed. Right. If you go back in time, we had Volcker. Hang up his hat, August 87. And then the crash in October. He had a crash a few months later. He had Greenspan hanging it up in January of 2006. And then you had the crash of 07, 08. 07, 08. He had Bernanke, which he hung up his hat January 2014. So what does that mean for 14, 15? I, that's a good question, and I don't know what that time frame is, but there is market digestion or indigestion when there's a handoff from one Fed chief to the next. As speculators try to figure out what rules are we playing by here, mm -hmm. what game are we going to play, how do we interpret the phraseology, how do we know what's being communicated, not being communicated, how do we interpret the silence. I mean, There's a number of things that the market has to figure out with a Janet Yellen New, different, better, worse, no one knows, but these transitional phases, note that they came when the stock market was doing all right, right. but not doing all right for the right reasons. It was not doing all right for the right reasons through the summer and fall of 87. Right. It was not doing all right for the right reasons in 2006 and seven. And it's not doing all right for the right reasons here in January, February of 24. So that's an interesting observation. I mean, we're talking for the last quarter of a century at least and a little bit more. Anytime there's been a Fed chairman change, we've had a stock market crash not long after that. Well, it's amazing the difference that a few days make. But blue skies, 30 days ago, universal bullishness. The VIX was at 12. Gold was on its back. Equities were at all-time highs. Earnings were assuming, you know, everyone assumed that we were going to see earnings grow from 5 to 8.5% this next year. The problem was companies were offering lower guidance in the face of Wall Street saying, no, 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 you're going to be doing that much better. And companies are saying, no, 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 we're going to be doing that much worse. That was the dialogue 30 days ago. Now we've got the market selling off the emerging markets, and all of a sudden a reemergence of concern how fast things change. Amazing yeah. the difference that a few days makes. Well, in January is an interesting month to watch. We were talking about the stock market, but usually you need a January to rise to have the rest of the year have a good year for the stock market. If you're looking at sort of the stock trader's almanac, it sets the tone. It doesn't guarantee anything, but nine times out of ten, if you've got a positive January, you're going to have a positive year. If you have a negative January, it's either going to be a flat year, nothing to show for it, or a year with losses. 
So, you know, this is one of the things, you know, in, in, in the conversations that I've had with Mike Gallagher over the last several weeks on his radio program, you know, we're, we're doing a conference down in Greenville, South Carolina here at the end of the month. Right. But we've offered to do a risk assessment for his listeners. And I think, you know, if you're not considering your allocations to equities, to bonds, to cash, and how all of that works together in terms of the risks that you're taking in the marketplace, and again, you may not think of cash sitting in the bank as at risk, but you are an unsecured lender to that institution. And we should check the ratings of the bank at least. Well, Certainly. I mean, that would make sense. If anyone is an unsecured lender, one, you should be highly compensated. Oops, you're not. And you should know what that risk is that you're actually taking. So I mean, you can call our office and get a, get a free assessment of the bank that you're in. My point is broader than that, though. Take time here at the early part of the year and assess the risk in your portfolio. You know, something that we do sort of on the back of a napkin is what we call our perspective triangle, mm-hmm. where you look and say, what am I asking my assets to do? What do I have that is liquid? What do I have that is helping me cover losses, that acts as an insurance policy against risk? risks in the portfolio, and where am I taking risks in fixed income and equities? And you know, The perspective triangle helps you organize what you're doing with your assets and helps you understand the risks implicit. Do you have adequate coverage for those risks? There's a lot in transition, and 2014 to 2016, I think, could be phenomenal years of wealth generation, but on the other side of that coin is phenomenal years of wealth destruction. And I think what people do right now to appreciate their risk implicit in their portfolios will determine where they're at two, three years from now. Are they able to retire two, three, four years from now, ten years from now? Do they set themselves on the proper trajectory to take care of family needs, meet financial expectations and goals, et cetera, et cetera? I think a serious conversation needs to be had about implicit risk in the portfolio and how to hedge that. I wouldn't delay. I would do that immediately. You've been listening to the McIlvaney Weekly Commentary. I'm Kevin Oreck along with David McIlvaney. You can find us at McIlvaney.com. That's M-C-A-L-V-A-N-Y dot com. Or call for a risk assessment at 800-525-9556. This has been the McIlvaney Weekly Commentary. The views expressed should not be considered to be a solicitation or a recommendation for your investment portfolio. You should consult a professional financial advisor to assess your suitability for risk and investment. Join us again next week for a new edition of the McIlvaney Weekly Commentary.